So my name is Dimos. Um, I'm a PhD candidate throughout my third year in the German Aerospace Center in the not so tropical or humid Berlin. Uh, and today I would like to present you my latest, our latest mapping efforts using remote sensing. Um, to present you a new um, uh, development and standardization of the uh, index for seagrass mapping. Uh, mainly for Mediterranean seagrass habitats, but with implications for um, other species and regions. Uh, so first, I will I want to set the scene. So either refresh or I introduce some new remote sensing information for you. Uh, and second, to introduce the index itself um, to present the remote sensing images that we used, and of course our test site on which we developed the index. Uh, some results with applied index, and I would like to dedicate the, the two last slides in my talk as regards to the future of not only our approaches, but the future of to where uh, seagrass mapping and monitoring should head towards. Uh, so some background on remote sensing. Um, so sensors on satellites, airplanes and drones have the ability to measure the reflected sunlight from Earth's surface and depending on the chemical structure of its element, so that being water, soil, green vegetation, geological structures, whatever, um, they can measure reflectance in different bands uh, from the visible to the mid-infrared. Um, so of course there are over 500 archived indices in remote sensing, but I cannot present them all, so I will present just the two most widely used. Uh, first is, of course, the NDVI. The NDVI measures uh, the higher reflectance in the near infrared and the lower reflectance in the red infrared to measure healthiness of vegetation, terrestrial vegetation. And, of course, there is also the modified normalized uh, difference water index, which measures uh, water surfaces. So these two, these two indices range between minus one and one and they're really good in discriminate uh, between both intraspecific elements, so being named DVI healthy to dead leaves, uh, to interspecific elements, so different species, different densities of vegetation species. Um, so as regards to vegetation-related applications, um, Roos in 1973 developed NDVI to measure terrestrial biomass, but this index has been then since then, it has been used in time series of uh, healthy croplets and leaf area index and related uh, biophysical variables. In contrast to NDVI, um, we propose the NDSGI uh, because NDVI measures, of course, uh, terrestrial vegetation, which has different um, reflectances, so they reflect high in the near infrared, the red which are highly attenuated by water. Uh, so instead, we have to use different bands to measure uh, seagrass healthiness. So of course, the first motivation was the need for uh, an extra quantitative metric for exactly measuring seagrass healthiness. Uh, also, of course, it has to be one reviewer, at least. Uh, so for me, it was the first year of my first PhD paper when I tried to, to publish about this index. So probably he's among us today. So I thank him, naturally. And yeah, just a small notice, NDSGI, the abbreviation, not NDSI, because uh, Salim, there's no R out there as well. Um, so yeah, as regards to the background, why we are using the green and blue wavelengths, uh, these are exactly where uh, the black line indicates us. So seagrass is, when you have a bottom reflectance, so we are in, on so you are having a sensor that measures uh, seagrasses above the seabed. Uh, it has to reflect high in the green and lower in the blue. Um, in comparison to the orange line, which is the top of the atmosphere, and the gray line, which is bottom of the atmosphere, but still not having corrected for water, water surface. And you can see two more examples of uh, exactly this uh, spectra profile for healthy seagrasses for other species as well. Um, so the important element here is uh, RB, which is ideally bottom reflectance. Um, 
So the difference stands for, of course, the difference between green and blue, and the normalization stands for uh, the total reflectance, which actually addresses differences between uh, different atmospheric and water column conditions between the different images or sensors, and of course, different acquisition angles between uh, the sensors. Um, yeah, so this is actually the equation to derive Rb. Uh, it might seem laborious, but let me tell you that it's not. Uh, the only tricky part is Z, which is the bathymetry, um, which you have to have in situ data uh, in order to derive it, at least empirically, through regression with um, pixels, so the values of what satellite images are providing us. But it can be feasible as long as you have the data. Um, so these were, these are the remote sensing images that I used. Uh, this range is from 2 to 30 meter resolution, so left to right. Um, so these are from the Thermaikos Gulf in the northwest Aegea. Um, and you can see the top, the two meadows, the two basic meadows on which we developed the index. So you have a dense Poseidonia Sianica meadow on the right, on the left, sorry, and on the right, a sparse Tsmodosiano Doza one. Um, so the first three images can be provided for free, but under a certain license. But the Sentinel 2 and Landsat 8 are, of course, free and open, available as archives. Um, so here are some indicative values. So you have again from left to right world view to Landsat 8 to Corsair resolution. Uh, these are values for the summer season for a typical Mediterranean setting. Of course, these are not absolute for uh, different regions and different species. Uh, so a possible future user of this index could uh, experiment before using, of course, these values. And it could be helpful of, of, towards establishment of, um, yeah, of uh, other thresholds as well, or more uh, accurate thresholds. Uh, so as I told in the first, in the structure, um, I would like to dedicate the last two minutes of my talk into talking about the future of seagrass mapping and monitoring. Um, so here you can see what we are currently developing using the Google Earth Engine platform. So it's a petabyte scale archive geospatial platform which holds um, open and free satellite imagery. So imagery like Landsat 8 or Sentinel 2. And what you see, it's a demonstration over Carfu. That's the North Ionia on the west part of Greece. Um, we will soon be publishing a paper that will demonstrate the use of this workflow for the whole extent of the Greek seas, so for both the Aegean and Ionian seas. So we actually employed more than 1,000 images, which stitched them together, took the best available pixels, depending on the cloud, uh, on cloud shadows, and atmospheric and water column conditions. And we mapped over 1,200 square meters of Poseidonia Sionica uh, in nearly 40 thousand square meters of uh, the Greek seabed. Um, and having said about that, of course, we are using a machine learning classifier, and machine learning classifiers feed on data. So sharing is caring, and yes, it will be important uh, for an accurate uh, output to have also accurate training and validation data. And it would be Amazing if, you, if, anyone's, if, if anyone is interested in using this workflow in different regions of the world um, to speak about, I can demonstrate the workflow and you can, um, we can discuss about the field data, of course. And I would like to end the talk by saying that um, in the intensive anthropogenic epoch that we are, that humanity is transversing, and of course, Sigas habitats and other coastal habits are transversing, um, accurate mapping efforts are, and monitoring efforts are uh, badly need, needed for, uh, to allow better management and conservation. And of course, not only mapping the distribution of sequences will be the first step, but mapping other biophysical variables over large scale and different time scales as well. So seasonal to decadal scales will be um, immensely helpful towards 
yeah, allowing for better management and conservation. Uh, so I would like to thanks, thank, of course, my professor for your supervision um, and my colleagues for their assistance and understanding, and of course the data providers for providing uh, the immensely valuable data. Yeah, thank you for your time and attention. Thanks, Dennis. We've got time for questions, if anybody has any. Um, one of the problems is that the seagrasses change their light capture into the accessory pigments as they experience more blue and green light and dimmer light. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, shown in, in two recent um, publications. But also, that if you don't use the NDVI, but you use some of the accessory uh, pigment combinations of, um, for, for looking at the seagrasses, you, you get a much finer um, you get a much finer delineation. And I, I don't think you can look at the species, perhaps general, mm -hmm. maybe general, but certainly I have yet to see any convincing species argument between related species, but we're really looking at general. But also, as you get deeper, you need, you need different, uh, completely different than NDVI, which, which is not telling you anything at all. Um, mm -hmm. at depths and dim lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our, our goal is to, of course, what we are saying is important for uh, small scales. Uh, and I think multispectral imagery, I agree that it's difficult to discriminate between individual species. Uh, but maybe using hyperspectral imagery, which has more bands, uh, which has a narrower width, spectral width, would be certainly helpful towards uh, discriminate at species um, level, but for a large scale, of course, that's uh, that will be difficult. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for good talk. Uh, in my experience, it is very important to uh, uh, correct the depth or uh, underwater radiation. So, well, in your case, I think it is possible to do it in this uh, specific location, but if you would like to uh, expand into uh, inside of the Google Earth engine, uh, is it possible um, to correlate, uh, co correct the wa wa water depth or wa water ra radiation? Could you please repeat the, the question? Uh, so, is it possible to uh, correct the water depth or underwater radiation mm. inside of the Google as anything in your uh, what you're trying to do. Yeah, I think as long as you have um, a small accurate but accurate bathymetry data set, you can correct for water column correction. Um, what is the most laborious uh, part? So atmospheric correction could be easily done, uh, empirically derived, but when you get to the water column correction, uh, you need bathymetry data or at least a way to maybe for an automatic derivation of uh, depth, which can be even more more difficult. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. We might leave it.